I randomly found this tea coffee table at a Habitat for Humanity Restore a couple of years ago and it's been in my storage room ever since. Now to some people this is just an ugly brown beat up coffee table, but to those who love mid-century furniture, you may see more here. This does have some finish issues, there's some dark staining, a lot of obviously gouges and scratches, some areas where it looks like there was tape, some chew marks, and I have a sneaking suspicion that at least the top of this may have been refinished before. I actually ran into a little hiccup with this and had to order some parts, so it's taken me a while to get this done, but let's get to work. My name is Angie and I refinish furniture. Sometimes I paint and sometimes I don't, but I always do what I can to save old pieces from the trash. Welcome to my workroom. So this piece has solid wood components and veneer areas. The leg assembly is entirely solid wood, it's solid teak. The trim pieces along the edge are also solid teak. This beautiful wood grain you see here on the underside is a veneer. Obviously the top is a veneer and then there's pressed wood in between. This piece was made in Sweden by the furniture maker J.O. Carlson, um, but it was designed by Carl Eric Excelius, and I'm hoping I'm saying that right. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. So here's some issues. This support bracket is completely broken, and you can see someone has written in marker. That would not be original to the piece, so that's one of the reasons I feel like this has been refinished, and also you can see some drips here. And these drips are not from food or some beverage that was spilled, it's actual polyurethane. There's also some damage here by these little locking cams, and the combination of the broken support and the cams that have come loose, and you'll see there's actually one that is broken, that's why the leg is starting to pull away from the rest of the table. These supports are solid wood and I'll have to have a good look at it. If it is a clean break, I might be able to glue this back together and have it hold up. When you have two wood surfaces that don't have any holes or bumps and they fit completely tightly together, using wood glue there is often a stronger bond than the wood itself. So hoping I get lucky with that. I'm just gonna pop these off. You can see there's actually supposed to be three of these cam screws in here and a couple of dowels. Here's where you can see that pressed wood substrate. This was a very common method of manufacturing in mid-century furniture. I have done a lot of mid-century pieces of varying qualities. What people don't realize is that a lot of the high-end stuff is pressed wood. It is just what they used back then. But looking here at the edge, this is a great view of just how thin that veneer is. And that's why a lot of first timers go at these pieces with an orbital sander with too aggressive a grit and they just blow right through the veneer. Even modern day furniture is made with this style of fastener, but this size is almost impossible to get around here where I am. I'm not sure exactly what this metal is. I'm 99% sure it is toast, but I'm going to try to press this back together and just see if it can possibly be twisted back into shape, but yeah, I don't think so. This was the piece that I had to order and the only place I could find it in this specific size was in the UK. Amazon carries tons of these, just not this size. It was about a two and a half to three week delay while I was waiting for those to come in. But that's okay, that gave me time to work on the last piece you saw. Now everybody has their own style and way of making these repairs. This is what works best for me when I have pressed wood that I need to epoxy back together. Wood glue is not really going to work here. You want a very strong epoxy. 
I just take a blade and cut out a little section from each side. You don't want too big a wedge or it's not going to go together properly. But you just want to make sure that there's a nice clean area where you can inject or push in some epoxy. I'm adding in as much as I can. Being careful not to get it in the actual hole. This stuff dries very hard and I'd have to re-drill the hole. I'm gonna add that in and clamp it down and just let it dry overnight. I've done this fix many times with pressed wood and it turns out really good. The key though is clamping pressure. If you don't have enough pressure to hold it flat, it's not gonna dry flat and then you're up the creek as they say. What's interesting about the support brackets where they are broken, you can actually see glue residue. So somebody tried to do this once before and most likely wasn't using the right amount of glue or didn't clamp it. There's no point in using wood glue on anything if you can't clamp it. You have to have that pressure. And of course the type of glue matters. I've seen repairs done with what looks like school glue or crazy glue and it's there's so many different types but you really have to have the right type for the job basically anything that I don't want to ever come apart again I will use wood glue on some joints that may need to come apart later on I tend to use hide glue which is more easily reversible than this wood glue and before I let these uh, set up for the rest of the day. I just want to make sure there's no glue in the screw hole Okay, now it's time to deal with these legs These are solid wood, but you can see these are made from several pieces of solid wood And I'm just making sure before I go any further that these are all sturdy. You can see those drips there that I was talking about These are kind of a mess actually But it is nice and solid so that's good. I don't have to make any repairs here While the other two brackets are drying, I'm just going to sand the veneer on the faces of these. And yes, there is a veneer on these. They're not solid teak like the legs are. This piece is pretty filthy, both from its past life and also sitting in storage for a couple of years. The finish on this is quite thin, so I'm actually just going to be sanding it off. And I don't often do that. I save it for very specific occasions. <laughs> These legs are solid wood, so I don't have to worry about sanding through a veneer. And in the time it would take me to put stripper on these, get it all stripped off, I could already be completely done sanding. With a fine grit, by the way, not a coarse grit. Now from afar, when I was applying the Odie Safer solvent, you were probably thinking, oh wow, that actually looks pretty good. It actually doesn't up close. There's a lot of finish issues here. And this is kind of a good example of why I'm not a big fan of products like Restore Finish in every situation. It's kind of a band-aid. Like I just put clear liquid on this and made it look so much better, um, but it's not better. It just, it's an illusion. <laughs> Restore Finish works great on pieces that have a little bit of surface damage, but as soon as you have scratches and gouges and chips that are down to the raw wood, that's not a candidate for Restore Finish. That's either spot repairs or full refinish. And I've seen the effects of using, I don't want to pick specifically on Restore Finish, there are other products like that, where people will just throw some oil on something because it temporarily makes it look good, just like I just did there. But when the finish is not intact and there's damage, it can actually make refinishing harder down the road. So using these products, you just have to know what you're working with and it shouldn't be your go-to. It should be reserved for specific situations.
Once I am finished with all of the flat sections, I'm going to grab one of these sponge pads. And what this will do, it will allow me to sand the rounded profile here without actually damaging it. And you don't need one of these foam pads, you can carefully do this if you have great hand-eye coordination and skill with a sander, or you can hand sand it. But you can see how quickly this goes with this pad, and no harm is done to the original shape of the legs, which is important to me. Now that is so much better. I'm going to do the same thing to the other leg, except this time I decided to pull these out. They just unscrew, just to make uh, sanding around them easier. And then once this one is done, I will add some OD Safer Solvent, which is just gonna help clean everything up in preparation for finish later on. Once I have my initial 150 sanding done, I'm going to go in with a 180 and basically do the same thing. And I'm going to be applying lacquer to this. Initially, I really wanted to do Odie's oil on it, but once I had this all sanded down and wiped some saver solvent on it and could see the natural color of the wood, there was kind of too much contrast there for me for this specific piece. So because of that, I'm going to be using a uh, vinyl sealer, some toners, and then lacquer. And now you will see how much better this piece looks with just a clear coat versus before when I just did it over the old finish. And that is the difference between products like Restore Finish and just throwing some lemon oil on something versus taking the time to properly refinish it. And again, that's only for pieces where the damage has gone completely through the finish into the wood. If you've only got a couple of light surface scratches and there's no damage to the wood, some oil or restore finish is fine. So the underside of the table has the maker's mark and it's quite light. I need to sand the bottom of this I honestly could have just cleaned it and left it at that, but when I redo things, I like to kind of redo it all. So I just put a piece of painter's tape there so that I don't accidentally <laughs> sand over it because it's not very visible. All right, let's deal with this top. There are some issues here that are apparent right away at looking at it. You can see the discoloration from what was the Habitat for Humanity Restore sticker. Obviously, hundreds and hundreds of scratches and marks. There are some rings that you can see on there. This looks like they had tape left for a very long time and then pulled it off. But there's some strange things. For example, this area here. 
this looks like finish that kind of got splattered. It's very plastic feeling and I'm pretty sure someone at some point put a polyurethane coating over some existing damage and you see this ring right here. Rings on furniture are not uncommon, but normally once they've penetrated through the finish and into the wood, they turn black. Do you see dark rings? These ones are white. White rings are usually damaged in the finish itself, but you'll see here that's not the case. But first, uh, I decided to switch to my scraper just because this whatever coating they put on this is a bit thicker and I don't want to spend so much time sanding when I don't have to. There's a couple things going on here. First of all, like I said, the ring itself is white in the wood, which is very strange. Normally it's dark in the wood. You can also see the area around it is a little bit darker and there's not as many scratches there. So this is what I think happened. I think they had some dark rings from a water glass and I think they tried to sand it out and even bleach it. And when you use a bleach or something like oxalic acid on just a stain, you run the risk of this happening where it will bleach out the stain, but then it's too light. And that's why you see refinishers that will apply oxalic acid to the entire top. And for someone just starting out, that doesn't make sense. It's like, why would you do it on the whole top when you're just trying to bleach out a stain? Well, this is why. <laughs> It's not every single situation. Sometimes you can put oxalic acid just on a stain and it's totally fine. This is one of those instances where it's not. You can even see how it, it almost looked like there was an oil there at some point. It's darker and that's not finish. That darkness around the ring there, that's not excess finish. That is some sort of oil product that is in the wood itself. I also discovered some dark spots at the other end of the table, which you couldn't really see with the old finish, but once I stripped it off, they were apparent, so I am going to be doing some oxalic acid on this. You can see there are also a lot of cross grain scratches but they're not quite deep enough to warrant steaming them out. So I'm just gonna do a sanding here with 150 grit and I'll finish with 180 grit and that's as high as I'm going on this table because of the finish that I'm doing. But first I'm going to add some oxalic acid to some water here. Oxalic acid is a wood specific bleach that targets things like water stains. I know it's a little bit tough to see when the wood is bare, but right here, Right there, there is some sort of weird dark stain. Now, oxalic acid is hit or miss on teak for some reason. I don't know if it's the oil content in the wood, but I either have really good luck with it or I have no luck at all. So we'll see how this one goes. Now the oxalic acid is not going to do much for this area that's already been bleached. But in order to prevent the same thing from happening when I use it on the dark stains, I have to apply it to the whole tabletop. Oxalic acid needs to be rinsed really well. So I'm actually doing two rinsings. I'm going to wipe off any of the excess water and then let it completely dry overnight. I know this doesn't look too bad while everything is raw, but as soon as you put anything on it, it's going to darken up and you'll still see that contrast with the white rings. Same with the dark spots. You can sort of see them here. It's not too bad, but as soon as I put anything on it, it's going to pop back up again. Unfortunately, the oxalic acid didn't really do much to remove those dark spots, but I had to give it a try. And because I need to do some touch-ups here and some color work and toning, I'm hoping that I can just blend it out with those products. Now 
Now that this is all sanded and cleaned and ready, there are three products I'm going to be using. I'm going to start with Mohawk Easy Vinyl Sealer and one of these paint can handles to make spraying it a lot easier. And I'm going to be sealing this piece in the end with Mohawk Pre-Catalyzed Lacquer. Now if you look over here, you can see a bunch of different toners. These come in lots of different colors. I'm only going to be using one color on this and that color is Perfect Brown. But first I need to seal the work that I've already done and then everything else will be on top of that. Working in layers. And I'm just showing this part here because I often get people that say that they buy handles and they don't fit. They are not super easy to put on, but yes, they will fit. <laughs> These handles really make spraying large areas so much more comfortable for your hands, and it gives you a better result. When you're using lacquer, you also want to make sure that you have a respirator on hand, or even better, on face. <laughs> and a few tips for spraying. You wanna make sure that you keep the can far enough away from the piece. If you have it too close, you're gonna get drips and runs, and you also want to sort of dance with it in a way. You wanna sort of sway back and forth so that you have a uniform consistency all along. You wanna aim for about a 50% overlap, so that means each time you make a pass, you're covering about half of the old pass. And as with most things that are sprayed on furniture, more light coats is better than fewer thicker coats. And you can see I'm standing in one spot, but I'm moving my arm the entire length of the table. If I were to just stand in one spot and just move my wrist, I would have inconsistent spray patterns and that's no good. I'm gonna be doing two coats of vinyl sealer on this and then I'm gonna start on my color work. I do get asked fairly often why I choose to use lacquer in spray cans when you can buy it in bulk and use something like a HVLP spray gun. And the reason is up until very recently, I did not have a compressor, which is needed to run those. Although I do have a spray gun, it's a Wagner um, that I have used for paint in the past, I prefer to keep that just for paint. So now that I do have a compressor, I'm going to try to find a good quality spray gun that I can use just for spraying lacquer so that it saves me money and I'm not going through as many cans because that kind of bothers me a little bit. I'm going to be adding the same vinyl sealer to the legs. Although I don't need to do repair color work on these legs, you'll see once I put this on that we've got a couple of different uh, tones of wood here and normally I embrace the natural variations in the wood, but with what I want to do with this, I need things to be a little bit more uniform. There are a few different ways that you can do this. You can use pigments, which work quite well, certain types of paints. I could have tried a stain, but that would be quite tricky to do in such a <laughs> specific area. I'm gonna be adding toner lacquer over this whole thing before I do my final seal coat. So what I need to do is I need to basically re-add the wood grain to the areas that have been bleached out. This doesn't need to be perfect right here. All I need is for it to be closer and the additional coats of lacquer and toner will help blend this out. So this is the color change after one foggy coat of the Perfect Brown toner. And the reason I'm okay going a little bit darker is that these pieces were often made of rosewood. This one's not, it's actually teak, but I do like the darker color in this case. So I'm gonna be doing one more, what I call a foggy coat. Um, basically what I'm saying is I'm not super close to the table, I'm just sort of fogging the color on. Toner is very easy to get blotchy if you're too close to the piece. So I like to do several very thin coats from a good distance. You get a much more even consistency. This is a piece that I'm going to be keeping and it's going in our living room where we have a lot of darker woods like walnut. So I'm okay with this being a little bit darker. So I'm finally able now to start with my coats of lacquer. I believe I did a total of five or six coats. Now you can see on the right there, that little dark spot, that is where that dark area was and that's just gonna have to be as good as it gets. The 
these tack cloths were an Amazon wishlist gift from a viewer named Jamie who actually sent me a bunch of goodies. So huge thank you to you, Jamie, for all of these things. I can't wait to use them. If you've actually sent me something over the last few months and you haven't seen it in a video yet, don't worry, I did receive them. Some of the things on my Amazon wishlist are quite specific, so I can only use them for certain projects, but until I can do specific shoutouts, um, just consider this an overall thank you to everybody who's helped support my channel in any way over the last two years. So this is where I'm at with the legs now after two coats of the vinyl sealer. And you can see here I am going to be adding some toner. I normally don't mind variations like I mentioned earlier, but some of these pieces, in fact even some of the same boards, will have areas that are very dark and very light and I just need to try to get this to blend a little bit better. And the difference between boards is actually really pronounced on this particular leg assembly. And look at this board, you've got very light areas and it gets darker toward the bottom. So because of the style that this is and the look that I'm going for, I'm not going to literally make it all the same color, I just want to bring it a little closer together. And here's where you can see what I'm talking about. It's not all identical in color, but the tones are definitely closer and I'm happy with this. With these, I need to make sure that they're going to stay in place. And often when these come out, it kind of destroys the threads. But all of these except for one were very tight when I put them in. And the one that wasn't all I did was add a little bit of epoxy and then screwed it in, let it dry, and it was totally fine. I need to make sure that these are facing the right direction. There is a point where there's an opening and then you turn the screw and it closes the opening and locks the cam into place but you won't be able to actually insert it in unless it's pointed in the right direction and these little pieces do have arrows on them so that you know what direction it needs to be in. They're actually really neat fasteners. I'm testing these the whole way along, especially the two pieces that were repaired, the ones that had broken. But I think now that the cam fastening system is fixed, that it'll put a lot less stress on these braces and they're just gonna sort of work together much better. And you can see there's no movement there at all. This is rock solid now. So I'm super happy with how this came out. This is the cam that I ended up having to replace, so I'm just making sure that that is in right and it's, like I said, turned to the right direction and then I can insert this side. If you remember initially, there was a big gap because these were not set properly and they weren't fitting quite right, but everything is nice and tight now.
Well, for you guys, this has been a half hour journey. For me, it's been about three weeks just because I had to wait for those parts, but I couldn't be happy with how this turned out. There were a few issues, like with the staining on the top, that I had to sort of work around, and to do so, I needed to make this a little bit darker than it would be naturally, but I'm okay with that. Like I said, a lot of these pieces were originally done in rosewood. For some reason, this one is teak, but I don't mind that it is a little bit darker, kind of more like rosewood. Thank you so much for watching, as always, and I hope you enjoy the reveal. See you next time.